afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I was really looking forward to coming and talking a little bit about stuff um, and our story, who we are, and also really about how we've tried to reimagine what we can become um, in this era of just ongoing change and disruption. Um, so I'll talk, a, I'll talk a bit about our business, what we're doing now, but also where we want to go in the future. Uh, but firstly, just a little bit about New Zealand. Um, you know, you probably know us for winning all the rugby, um, <laughs> having great wine, beautiful scenery, prime ministers who routinely serve out a full term, uh, not just their elected term, but a full term, to carry a baby and come back and work and kick ass doing that as well. And I would think that all of those things should be what put New Zealand on the map, but um, we have a problem in New Zealand where there is a continuous trend now to put out world maps, official maps, that don't feature our country at all. <laughs> you might notice something so say, yeah, global warming, global melting, we've melted right off. And it's not a one-off, that's a World Health Organization map, and we're not even on it. And it's, you know, it's on World Natala Day, no Natala for New Zealand. It's at the Chinese airports, nothing on the map there. It's even on maps around how human rights are getting violated around the world, and I would think that is a premium violation of our human rights, as not to count us in there at all. But that's okay, we'll get over that and we'll just get on with doing what we want to do. So who are we? Um, stuff. Um, we used to be Fairfax Media New Zealand, you know, the New Zealand-owned aspect of a big company here. Uh, in one form or another, we've been around for 160 years in New Zealand, uh, with a, and we uh, start off as a collection of local New Zealand newspapers, daily newspapers, community, community newspapers, and we gradually uh, grew into the digital age with the creation of stuff.co.nz, our big digital news brand. Um, it's actually 18 years ago now. It started up as a repository for all that daily newspaper content. Um, and you can imagine back then, um, and for quite a long time afterwards, the name Stuff um, copped a lot of flack, uh, you know, particularly from our own journalists, I was one of them, um, about what a silly name it was, and no authority, no credibility, who was going to buy news or trust news from something called Stuff. Um, but when you look back, as we did on our birthday, at what we could have been called instead, um, it really could have been a lot worse. Um, we could have been the gumpf.co.nz. This was on the shortlist, prepared by Saatchi's um, in a cafe somewhere. We could have been deepandwide.co.nz. Um, I would have been here talking to you about a whole different business model if we were called that. And we could have even been blahblah.co.nz, in which case I don't think I would have been invited here at all. So um, stuff is pretty much... Uh, uh, you know, where we landed, and we're really pleased now because in the age of Googles and Yahoos and Twitters, stuff has really come into its own. So uh, stuff is now 18 years old. It's the biggest domestic digital brand in New Zealand. And that kind of silly name has ended up giving us the ability to think about us and what we could do um, in ways that we never would have thought about when it was first created. Uh, so we're not only just the biggest news brand, we're the biggest domestic brand of any kind, and the only ones bigger than us are those big internationals, Googles and Facebook. And we are really mu pretty much in the same air as them. And I want to dwell on that position because it is a really central fact to our transformation. Um, like everybody, uh, we have been you know, really tr challenged by the disruption of our industry over the last few years. Um, we knew, uh, you know, we sat down three or four years ago and thought, right, what are we going to do? Because we knew digital ads alone were not going to be enough. And we knew that with a country of only 4.5 million, 4 million people, that paid content alone was not going to be enough. Um, the economics of that don't flow down in a market the size of ours. But we also knew we had amazing assets, you know, papers in every community, at the biggest website in the country, um, unrivaled scale in our market. And if we were in the same era as the platforms, what would happen if we started thinking like them instead of thinking like a news publisher? So we started to think, what about if we thought about stuff as a platform instead of as a news site? What could that open up to us? 
uh, what could we do? Well, we become a channel for other publishers to distribute their content to New Zealand audiences. We could be a platform for businesses to, you, to directly use um, e-commerce to reach their customers directly. And we could also be a platform to launch and grow our own new businesses that have nothing to do with media at its core. In fact, not only could we see how we could act like some of the platforms, but we thought about what we had. There were extra advantages over the top of them, and unfortunately, that wasn't a trillion dollar market cap. But we did have trust, and trust from our communities built up over 160 years, and we did have New Zealand journalism, um, high quality local and national New Zealand journalism, and the social good that is at the heart of what a journalistic organisation wants to achieve. Um, so we have realised though that the journalism itself wasn't our competitive advantage. It was what created our created a competitive advantage, which was that scale of audience and the trust that came along with that content. So. I can actually remember the day we sat down and thought, okay, we are done being the victims here now, and it's time for us to start acting like the aggressor. And we made a really conscious decision to move from being disrupted to being the disruptor. And that meant looking at what we could do to not only develop new things in our own industry, but where we could go into other people's industries and cause them a bit of upset. And what sort of things could we do if we went into other markets apart from ours? We had trust, we had scale, we had um, you know, large amounts of advertising inventory that weren't necessarily as full as they could be. Um, we had every asset that we needed to develop and grow our own businesses. Um, that, didn't mean, that meant we didn't have to rely solely on publishing revenues from advertising and subs um, in the way that we had done up until then. So we started with Stuff. Um, Stuff as a Kiwi platform is a New Zealand-owned, trusted and high-quality alternative for other publishers and for other businesses to consider using instead of Facebook. So the first thing we did was we partnered with other New Zealand publishers who, dis who agreed to use stuff as a distribution channel to reach their audience as an alternate to Facebook. Um, in some cases, they still use Facebook, obviously, but they started to try, uh, uh, test publishing their content on stuff. Uh, this was about three or four years ago. Um, so we started with Television New Zealand, which is the big state-owned broadcaster. Uh, moved to Radio New Zealand, and then we added Maori Television, and we've got Newsroom, which is a, um, a new uh, a high quality uh, journalism startup, and, and many, many more, I'd say that, including the local Chinese media and local Indian media in our, in our country. So these publishers are finding through stuff they are reaching bigger audiences than they could before, and we are revenue sharing on all of the money that they make off their inventory on stuff. That's great for stuff itself, of course, too, because we are um, expanding the quality, the breadth and depth of the quality on our site. And by bringing in all the ethnic publishers, we are also fulfilling that mission of trying to serve um, all New Zealanders and reach them um, in all ways. And we just don't have that aspect to our journalism going on. We also created Pop Shop, which is a direct e-commerce platform for businesses to simply set up a storefront on stuff and uh, directly transact with their customers. That's been hugely successful. We've sold everything from Samsung phones. And in fact, I think we were at, at one point when we launched that the highest seller of Samsung phones in New Zealand to sofas, to jewelry, to tickets, to all sorts of things um, because uh, new businesses are, re are using us to transact directly instead of going through one of the platforms. Um, and not only did we collaborate with um, other publishers on putting content through stuff, but we banded together with other New Zealand publishers and broadcasters, the four top companies, to create um, Capex, which is a Kiwi programmatic ad exchange, which meant that all um, of us with all of the premium ad inventory in the country um, had our own exchange uh, and, and was there to take a stake in that market and to try and fend off Google a bit. And that's still going now. That's been really successful for us. So the other thing about stuff as a platform was that we could see it had that potential to launch our own new businesses. And the first thing we did was invest in a startup called Neighbourly. And Neighbourly is, um, is a hyper-local social network. Um, again, a strategic step into a space that's 
uh, not been traditionally part of a media organization's territory. Uh, it's similar to Nextdoor.com in the States, um, a bit like Nabo here, although I don't know how much cut through Nabo has um, in this market. Um, you sign up uh, with your real name, your real address, and you get access to the same for all the people who live in your neighborhood to communicate, to trade, to share information, uh, buy, sell, exchange, all sorts of things. Um, and then we pushed in the power of our whole, uh, uh, the rest of our business, all of our marketing assets, our editorial teams, um, our product teams, etc., in behind making this a success. So it started off when we bought it um, with 40,000 members and now it has 650,000 members a few years later, and it's still growing like that. Um, and it is uh, profitable. It was profitable really early on in the trajectory. Um, so it's already spawned its own sub-business, Marketplace, which is a trading app that's taking on um, TradeMe and Facebook in our market um, with a really simple uh, way to uh, trade, buy, sell, and exchange stuff in your own neighborhood. Um, and I think, you know, what neighborly did particularly was to augment and give us a really rich market uh, a membership base so we've got 1.3 million members again in a country where there's only four and a half million people that's a really rich deep um, and big marketplace and that membership and the data that we've got and the insights we've got through those have allowed us to move on to that next stage of our development um, to launch into a whole new array of products and services that have nothing to do with media so firstly, uh, we went into the internet business. Um, Stuff Fiber is um, a high-speed internet provider that we launched uh, less than two years ago uh, to coincide with the government, New Zealand government's rollout of ultra-fast broadband for every home in New Zealand. Um, it was a perfect window of opportunity because it was a level playing field for any retailer to get in there and, um, and have a go, and that's what we did. Uh, so we use, again, all of our marketing assets, all of the data that we have in our membership base to drive people to buy fiber from us with a really simple no contract model. Um, it's less than two years old, but it's already going extremely fast and it has got the top customer satisfaction scores of any internet provider in New Zealand. So we're really pleased with that. And that led us on to um, electricity. So last year, late last year, uh, just before Christmas, we launched Energy Club NZ, which is a low-cost electricity retailer. So basically, you pay a few dollars a week, uh, I think it's four or five dollars, as a club fee, and on top of that, you get your electricity at cost. So very low cost, very flexible, weekly billing. Um, and again, we took advantage of government deregulation of that market. And I think this is one of the key things that we, like we did with Stuff Fiber. We know nothing about internet, nothing about the energy sector, so we partnered with entrepreneurs who are experts in that area. They brought all the know-how from that and that startup and entrepreneurial energy, and we brought all our marketing power and the huge um, scale of our assets and audience to bear on that. And then the latest one, I think um, only a few months old, is Stuff Picks, which is uh, streaming blockbuster movies. Um, and here's where we start to think that we're building up a real ecosystem of products because each one of these has not only launched off the one that's gone before, but they are all able to support each other and help each other flourish. So um, fiber, for example, and electricity can be bundled together and sold as a seamless product. Uh, Stuff picks, we use the free blockbuster movies as retention and rewards for our customers and the other businesses. I think that ecosystem is really important um, because it is now at the heart of our strategy, the fact that it is an ecosystem. And we've moved from thinking about delivering products um, in markets that were either print or digital and quite distinct from each other to thinking more in a way that we're in this connected customer um, experience universe and what can we create in terms of customer services and consumer products across a whole array of things. Um, and so we, we feel like we've made a big step into um, the direction that we want to, where we want to go in future to create a sustainable business that can support New Zealand journalism. But we're definitely not done. 
we have dis diversified and we have started to disrupt some other industries. I've had both, you know, um, the CEOs of certain telcos in New Zealand come to see me to ask, what are we doing? Um, launching an internet provider and what, what did we think we were doing and they were going to pull their ads out if we did that. And they did pull their ads out of that, but we filled them with ads for our own business and they've had to put their ads back in to counter that. The, the same happened with the, um, in the energy sector where one of the other very successful new energy businesses, a few years older than ours, wrote to make an official legal complaint that we were using our own ads to promote a business that we owned. And again, we were like, you are very welcome to use those ad spaces yourself. Um, but in the meantime, we'll just continue uh, building a business. Interestingly enough, just a random point, the most effective channel for converting new um, uh, uh, customers to those new businesses has been print wraparounds in our daily and community papers. So, um, but now, you know, I, I guess what we've done is we've realized that you need to look outside media and outside our own industry to see what we can do and how we need to change and what the opportunities are for us in the future. And I think, you know, we all probably have heard that, um, you know, there have been four big revolutions, obviously, steam, uh, electrical, um, computers and digital. And we're the only generation to have lived through two of those ever. Computers and digital have both come within our lifetimes and the space between them is shortening. And so we know that change is permanent and we know that digital now is just breaking down boundaries all over the place um, between humans and machines for one place um, and, is, and definitely geographically. It won't really matter if you're not on anybody's map in future because you can achieve anything from any part of the world. But we know that to be successful in this new world, we have to really reframe how we think about business and, um, and move into the same way that um, startups and entrepreneurs and the big platforms think about business. So we've all traditionally been in environments where risk management is what we do all the time. Boards, CEOs, executives, we're all about managing risk. And we need to move to embrace risk, um, where risk is an essential element and the embracing of it to be able to succeed in future. Um, that's how startups uh, go into all sorts of things that nobody else ever saw that there was a space to do. Um, and we have to move from, you know, spending our time trying to divide, uh, you know, um, describe and serve broad customer segments to realize that this is a world where everything is hyper-personalized. Um, everything uh, is uh, for a universe of one. And for us, that means thinking about not just stuff for 4.5 million people, but 4.5 million versions of stuff and all of the services that we can provide around that. Uh, we've always traditionally uh, operated within pretty closed ecosystems where you look to work within what you've got, but now we have to look uh, to create ecosystems that are completely open where the most natural thing is to partner with other businesses, other people in other industries, and where that's extremely fluid, but that that open up, opening up of your ecosystem and that ability to really work outside your industry is essential to success. And, you know, the dream is to move from um, creating stakeholder value and shareholder value with what you've got to just creating exponential value with limitless possibilities about what you could do and what you become. So we are obviously not the only ones in the space and we've really spent a lot of time looking externally, see who else has been really uh, rethinking what they can do and what we might learn along the way. So these are three examples. Um, Different to us, but with some commonalities about where we've been. So Best Buy, um, big uh, electronics retailer in, uh, in the States, and retail and electronics retail is probably almost as challenged and disrupted as media over recent years. So they were facing a really exist exist existential oh, crisis um, because everyone was just buying all their stuff online and not coming into their stores anymore. So they sat and rethought about who they were and what role they fulfilled for people. And they realized that when people come in to buy a TV, it wasn't because they wanted something to sit in the corner and put their grandmother's china on top of it. They were buying entertainment. Um, and when someone came in to buy a um, security camera, again, it's not the thing, it's what it gave them. It was home security and a feeling of security and safety. 
Um, so they changed their whole business model to move from uh, being not just a retailer of these things, but to partnering with others who could provide um, uh, cable television um, services, um, health insurance, home security contracts, all, all the things that went down the line that people did after they bought that particular uh, device or piece of hardware from their stores. So what that did is not only give them a one-off, um, you know, uh, amount of money from selling the item, but recurring revenues from all the services that they uh, partnered with thereafter. They have um, seen their share price increase 56% in one year and have had quarterly growth year on year for um, the last couple of years. Uh, and also, they own all the data now for all these customers who formerly just bought a device and left the store, and now they sort of connected into them through all the other things they do there. Asda, a uh, big supermarket chain, and again, uh, people were going online, um, ordering everything online, and they were left with really um, burdensome cost problems of uh, shops that were half empty, shelf space that was not utilised, warehouses that only had 60% um, uh, of their capacity filled up, um, and they were really struggling under the burden of these fixed costs. Again, that's something that will be familiar to a lot of media businesses and print businesses in particular. So what they did uh, was to start to see how they could use all those assets, those physical assets, in completely different ways. And they partnered with a whole range of other retailers to say that um, their customers, the, re the customers of these other retailers, could return any product into an ASDA store, and ASDA would then return it on to the, you know, the source retailer from that. And what that meant was that all of a sudden all these other retailers' customers were coming back into ASDA stores to return their products, their footfall increased hugely, and the spend in those stores also in increased hugely. Plus, they were getting new revenues out of sharing space in their warehouses, et cetera, with everybody else. And um, Boeing, um, just they build planes, right? But now um, they build um, digital replicas, digital twins of each plane, so that all the sensors from every plane sends back th you know, thousands, thousands, thousands of constant data points. Um, and one of the biggest problems for airlines is unscheduled maintenance. It's a big problem for us too, um, $8 billion a year. So now Boeing see that half of their future revenues will come from supplying data services to airlines to allow them to predict, that predict when the next piece part might need to be replaced, uh, the next something's going to happen, that means they can deal with it before it happens and, just, and avoid that disruption of customers. So they're moving from being just a manufacturer to being a provider of digital airline services. So, the, the common um, questions I get for, I guess, for them and for us and for all of you is to think there are three different ways to grow. Um, firstly, how can you maximise your existing revenue streams? And for us, we're doing that through stuff, opening stuff up to other publishers and opening it up as a channel for, um, for others' commerce. How can we create new lines of business that don't exist at all? And we're doing that with things like fibre and energy, et cetera, et cetera. And how then can you enhance and extend the value chain across every point to, and convert that into revenue? And that both means making the most of all your existing assets um, and doing the best, and also looking for that vertical kind of disruption, which is into other markets and into other industries. And that's led us on to um, a real journey that we, um, we still feel that we're early on. Um, so what it takes really is a marriage of your capabilities and your creativity. And we're all from creative industries, right? But I think sometimes we're most afraid to be creative about what we do with our own business models. Our capabilities are content, journalism, um, our connections into communities, our mass marketing capacity, our communications platforms. And now the opportunity now is for how creative we can be to really be bold and take more risks into the future. And of course, we're not going to succeed in doing that if we are not culturally fit as an organisation. Um, over the last year, we have made a really deliberate and focused effort 
internally to make sure that people understand the journey we're on. We've put the startups right into the middle of our, like literally into the middle of our um, office floors, right beside the newsroom, and we put all their metrics up on screens and everyone's encouraged to stop and chat and try and understand how they work and what's going on. And we have also tried to make sure everyone understands that the reason we are into electricity and internet, et cetera, et cetera, is because it's really essential that we can still fund journalism into the future and that we need to find new ways of doing that. This is a picture of a lovely um, Emma from our Auckland office who works um, for us. Um, she came to us through a creative spirit program uh, created by one of our staff, Anna Marie Jamison, um, to offer uh, jobs for people with disabilities in our office. And um, she and the others who work with her are wonderful additions to uh, our Auckland Wellington Christchurch offices. And a part of what we've tried to do to make stuff a really diverse and inclusive way of work, uh, place to work and one where we can, um, I, I guess, reflect our purpose back internally to help Kiwis connect and thrive as well as externally. So we've made a focus on promoting diversion, inclusion, um, clearing pathways for uh, more women leaders. Uh, my executive is 60% women now, it's something I'm really proud of. And, um, and, and, and just trying to infuse back into the business a sense of optimism and confidence and belief that we can succeed despite all the external changes that are out there and that we can be masters of our own destiny. So this is, you know, if you look, think back to the Best Buys and the Asdas, et cetera, this is where we are on that journey. A few years ago, we thought about ourselves as a publisher and we're there to sell advertising and, um, you know, newspapers and uh, try and figure out what we're going to do with digital, but it was probably going to be more of the same. And now we see that we're a business that's got an ecosystem of connected customer services, products, experiences. We do news, we do entertainment, we do energy, we do internet. We do home services. You know, now we have a router into the homes of um, you know, a whole lot of New Zealanders through uh, stuff fibre. We have connection into your smart meter. So that opens up for us the potential to do a whole lot more in terms of home services and, and things in the homes in future. Um, so who else, who knows where that will go in the future? Um, you know, we're really excited about what the next, ray, uh, I guess, wave of uh, revolution and disruption will offer us. And we're determined to keep seeing that as opportunity rather than threat and challenge. Um, and to, you know, assert ourselves and the power of the assets that we have and the place that we have in New Zealand society. So I would um, encourage you all, um, you know, when you're thinking about what's the challenges to cover here, to stop and to really think about your business and who you are and what you do and try and reframe it in a completely different way. Because for us, it really was like a light bulb had gone off when we did that. And we were able to see that the sorts of revenue streams and the sorts of opportunities that would continue to fund journalism didn't have to have anything to do with journalism or advertising or publishing into the future. And for us, I think, you know, our businesses now, those new businesses, are delivering more in annualised um, recurring revenues than we would hope to be able to get through digital content subscriptions um, in a market the size of ours. And that's all money that we're going to be able to plough back into you know, fulfilling our purpose and our place in New Zealand. So, thank you very much. Sinead, that's an as I say, it's an extraordinary story when you think about how, I'm just trying to think of who else might be doing anything like that. Uh, I mean, Kogan is sort of going off into all sorts of different areas, but he's doing joint venture deals in this country in, in different spaces. Now, um, your brand is, I think it's one of the, the top 20 trusted brands yeah. in New Zealand. Okay, so what happens when your energy business stuffs up? Um, so two things happen. Um, firstly, when we partner with any uh, uh, in any joint venture or entrepreneur, they have to understand clearly what kind of ethical values and structure our company is built on in the first place mm -hmm. and agree to behave in the same sort of way. And the second thing that happens is that they find out our journalists don't give them a free ride if they stuff up. So you've still got that fierce yeah, New Zealand. Totally. And um, I think that's, I think I've had every single one of those entrepreneurs come to me at some point and go, oh, 
why have the journalists written this? I'm like, because, you know, they're independent and they're there to serve the reader, not to serve the growth of your business. So, um, so far that's worked fine. And, the, and um, one or other of them have been in the news for things that we might not wish they were over the last, um, you know, year or two for sort of wording and advertising and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it's really essential that we can keep that aspect separate. And you have been, in a way, driven to this, or the board's been driven to this, because you're looking for alternatives to revenue uh, that you came in either through a subscription model or indeed advertising. Yeah, we, uh, we're definitely looking for alternatives, but we're also um, looking at how we can exploit the opportunities that we have with this massive um, platform and stuff mm. and the trust. And also the brand itself is so elastic now. It's not like a newspaper masthead brand. Um, it's not called the New Zealand Times. And so it does allow us to take forays into other areas. And, um, and you know, our readers uh, have become our customers in other ways. And we've got new customers into our company through those services that we didn't have before. Mm. I mean, there are, there are people in this country who'd be very sort of wary of if suddenly one of our listed companies went off and did something like this. Um, I mean, you're a, you're we a are journalist. Kind of a you're a journalist. Yeah. You're a CEO, but you, yeah. your background is editorial. Yes. Um, um, and you're now running, a, as I say, an energy company, an internet provider. I mean, this is, and you're talking growth, growth, growth. Um, how do you manage something like that? <laughs> With some really good people all around you. Um, and also we as a company are not the experts in the internet world or the energy world or what have you. So, um, you know, a, a crucial part of the formula, because it is a formula now that we see works and can be repeated is to find the entrepreneurs who are and to partner with them. They bring those strengths and we bring ours and then we can turbocharge the growth of new companies. Okay. And while they are growing really strongly, we have had some that haven't worked out, you know, some for one reason or another and that's, we expect that to be more in the case. Um, and we're still facing the, the headwinds that everybody else is in terms of, you know, we're still um, reliant a lot on advertising and print subscription revenues, but we're trying to make this transference to a more diversified base to give us a, a surer future. Does anyone have a question? Yep, one over there. So while, while we're waiting, um, uh, just um, Hugh Marks is about to take you over, isn't he? Um, yep. So I'm just wondering, I, I know he was sort of thinking, okay, he's got, a, he's got, an, he's got an e property. Uh, business in domain. Now he's got uh, not just Fairfax New Zealand, but um, he's got all these different businesses. Do you know how he sort of looks at it and what will happen? I mean, um, you know, I don't. Is that a we haven't had the chance. No, I don't think so. I think um, wherever we figure in the in the expanded nine universe, um, we've always been a New Zealand company and we've always run our own race um, in order to serve New Zealanders. So well, we look forward to seeing what opportunities might come out of the nine um, marriage. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, we're focused on what's happening back at, back home. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yes. Where were we? Where? Yes, sir. Um, inspiring address, mm. uh, Sinead. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Ken Burrows. Um, I'm interested. So the diversification uh, came from a need to fund journalism uh, and find alternative revenues. How do you, into the future, protect the journalism from the uh, growing uh, arms of your business and, and a board that may at some point go, we're an, we're an electricity company or we're a communications company now, we need to cut journalism adrift? Yeah. I mean, I think we'd be quite far away if ever getting to that point because um, the journalism is what brings that audience to us in the first place that we need to be able to launch the new businesses and scale them up. And it'd be great to think that, um, you know, it's fibre or energy or whatever, that we've been able to do that and get them to the point that we can potentially um, sell them off individually if they needed to be because they're standalone strong entities. Um, but at the moment we're focused on building that sort of, you know, that re recurring revenue because the way we look at it is like, uh, you know, a monthly internet bill or a weekly electricity bill, that is a digital subscription. It's just not for content. So, um, and that's how we talk about it internally too, to, to our newsrooms and to the other parts of the business about why we're doing this. Um, 
but we've you know we've gone through decades of making sure editorial is protected from the other commercial aspects of our business. These are just different commercial aspects. Got another question up there? Yes. Yeah, it's a related question about reputation, but concerning your role as a, as a platform for distributing other publishers. Mm -hmm. How do you protect your reputation journalistically when you've got other content that's going through? Is there quality control to pre yeah. if there's disinformation or so-called fake news or whatever that's coming up from other publishers? How do you deal with it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and every single publisher and broadcaster that we uh, channel through our platform is from a really high quality, reputable company. Um, and there have been some that we have decided we can't put, like some, there have been some Chinese media, for example, that we have decided we couldn't put through because we ourselves couldn't be confident enough in what the translated version of that story was. And the, so, you know, we just, um, and on, on, for two reasons. First was for our reputation and to make sure we could keep up our, you know, our standards no matter whose content it was. But secondly, um, we are not, um, we're not, you know, any content that we produce on staff or publish, we are liable for under New Zealand defamation laws or other laws ourselves. So we have to be really careful. Mm. Another one? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, you were talking about using your media assets and content to actually push your customers to new businesses. Yeah. Are you finding that you can actually work it the other way as well? So you're connecting, obviously, with new audiences through some of those businesses. Are they then coming back to your clients? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's why it becomes the ecosystem now, because someone might come to us for the first time as an energy customer and be introduced through that to all of our other products, um, some of those being content products, some of them being, you know, Neighbourly, um, ISP, et cetera. And that's the kind of, I guess that's the power that we still feel we're only just at the beginning of harnessing that and making sure that if you are one of our customers, that you're just surrounded by the seamless customer experience um, and that we really carefully use um, the data that we had collected across all of those to understand not only what who you are, what you want, but what you might want next. So for, through Neighbourly, for example, we know when you're going to move to a new house. Uh, so we can make sure that we are serving you with, oh, here yeah, you are moving to a new house. What about an easy electricity and an easy internet connection? And, you know, don't worry, your paper's going to be delivered there seamlessly as well. All those kind of things are possible. And uh, is the Commerce Commission happy with your grand expansion? I suppose they're all different markets, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the uh, ACCC equivalent. Yeah, they have not had any um, anything to say about uh, our expansion in, in those sort of different ways. Yeah, you're just yeah. building a conglomerate. Yeah, and you know, let's face it, compared to some of the incumbent um, telcos and uh, providers, we are still small and young. So yeah, yeah. Last question from anyone? Just curious how you choose what business, they seem very random. Yeah. How do you make that decision? Do um, entrepreneurs come to you? And is there a business that you wouldn't go into? Is it, it sounds quite exploitative. Yeah, so um, we do have a set of criteria. Um, first is that, um, you know, back into the businesses we wouldn't go into, we would not go into a business that jarred with our ethical core that is at the heart of the journeys that we produce. So we wouldn't, I could not ever imagine us go into gambling or selling cigarettes or, you know, th I, I, those kind of things that are not with, that it has to be something that even if it's not in our core, it's an extension of the kind, you know, we can still have the same values and, um, behave the same way. Um, I guess we look for um, uh, things like where there is an opportunity to enter that market. And for, say, fibre, it was the government rollout for energy. It was that sort of deregulation and the opening up to other retailers. So, um, you know, we weren't the first to go into that. There were a whole lot of entrepreneurs who saw those opportunities before us. Um, and secondly, there has to be an opportunity where the, the very partnership between that person um, and us uh, will rapidly be able to scale that business into something else. So that has to be a business that our marketing power, our audience power, will make a significant difference to. Um, and utilities has been, has been a clear one of those. And as I say, some things we have had a foray into and they just for one reason or another haven't really flown or haven't kind of got big enough, fast enough 
for us to focus on. Um, but we do also can now consider it as a whole. So obviously fibre might be here and electricity here, but actually they work really well together as home services and on top of a hyper-local, neighbourly you you know, model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. Well, it's, <laughs> it's an extraordinary story, Sinead. I, I mean, I must say I've learnt a lot, um, but it's a great story. And thank you very much. Great stuff. Thank you. Please welcome, uh, thank uh, Sinead Badger. Thanks very much.